We have in today's Gospel reading an account of our Lord's transfiguration when he manifested to three of his disciples something of his divine glory. And the question we might ponder is, why did our Lord do this? I mean, he had spent nearly three years with his disciples. He had manifested his ability to do miracles, his tremendous wisdom, his ability to escape any and every trap laid for them, even casting out demons. All of these things indicated that he is God. But on this occasion, he takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. These three were to have significant roles in the early church. These three were closer to our Lord. And our Lord wanted these three especially to be an example to the others. So he wanted to strengthen them in their faith, in their belief that he is indeed God. So he manifests his divine glory. And notice also the appearance of Moses and Elijah. So Jesus has Moses and Elijah appear. And they're conversing with our Lord. So the apostles hear what they're talking about. But you see, Moses symbolizes the law. And so the presence of Moses indicates that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Elijah represents the prophets. He's one of the greatest prophets of Old Testament times. So uh, his presence indicates that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the prophetic utterances by the prophets of old. So all of these things confirm that Jesus is who they believe that he is, that he is truly God incarnate. And um, when our Lord, you know, he chose these three disciples to be with him on this occasion, it's also noteworthy that these three would also be the same three that would accompany our Lord into the Garden of Gethsemane. And in fact, when Jesus is conversing with uh, Moses and Elijah, part of what they're talking about is the fact that he will have to undergo his passion and death. And notice also when they come down the mountain, Jesus says to them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. In other words, he's indicating to them he needs to die. And it's kind of like they, they didn't want him to die. They didn't think he would die the way that he did. And so when, when the time of our Lord's passion comes, we see that the apostles... They all flee. They all lose courage. They all lose hope. They lose faith. And this is the very thing our Lord wanted them to prevent them from, from happening, to prevent this from happening to them. So the only one of all the apostles was John the Evangelist who stayed with our Lord. He's the only one who stood at the foot of the cross. He's the only one who persevered. So when it comes to belief in our Lord, you know, we might say, well, we didn't experience the transfiguration of our Lord. You know, how can we be expected to have great faith? But the reality is that we have way more evidence in support of belief in our Lord and belief in, in God than the, the apostles themselves, even though they spent three years with our Lord. So in other words, in every age, we have all kinds of great saints, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Padre Pio, uh, St. Andre Bisset here in Canada, and all kinds of miracles also, miracles in the Catholic Church. And we have apparitions, such as the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima, the miracle of the sun, witnessed by 70,000 people. We've got top-notch scientists talking about intelligent design theory. Um, we, we've got all kinds of arguments for the existence of God, philosophical arguments and all kinds of arguments. We have evidence of near-death experiences. We have evidence of angelic beings. We have evidence of people becoming possessed. There's so much evidence in support of our faith. We even have the Shroud of Turin, you know, it supports uh, the belief in, in the resurrection of our Lord. We have the witness of the apostles, you know, laying their, their, down their lives, being martyred for the truths of our faith. We have the witness in every age of the great saints. So there's so much evidence for us. And yet sometimes we're like the apostles. Lord, increase our faith. So in other words, we shouldn't be like that. We should have great faith in God. Recently, I encountered an elderly Catholic, someone who's very devout and uh, practices their faith. And I can't remember how it came up in our conversation, but this person was under the impression that God sends certain souls to hell. And I tried to explain to this person that that is not the case. Uh, 
Now, it is true there's some scripture passages that seem to kind of imply that. For example, you know, when Christ at the end time, he comes and he will separate the sheep from the goat, right? In other words, the judgment of God and God will separate the sheep from the goat. But you see, when you think of a law court, right, what happens in a court of law? Yes, there is a judge, there is a jury, but what happens in a, in a court of law is the truth is made manifest. So the lawyers, they present their arguments, the truth becomes evident. And so what the person deserves, they get what the person has chosen. In other words, by choosing to sin, by choosing to commit a crime, you are deserving of a certain punishment. But you see, scripture scholars and, and theologians, they point out that there is no one in hell who doesn't want to be there. In other words, to be in hell is a personal choice. Now, how we make that choice or how individuals make that choice, that can be debated. But some choose to rebel against God, to rebel against God's commandments. And, you know, it's not as if God arbitrarily makes up these commandments. These commandments are good for us. So when we break the commandments, we're not just offending God. We're going against what, what nature kind of indicates is the right thing to do. So the other thing is that very often people get angry with God. And I, I've mentioned before, every now and then I encounter somebody who's been away from the church like for a very long time and they make their confession and I ask them, you know, they sound like a good person. I ask them, you know, why, why were you away from the church for so long? And they say, oh, I was a good Catholic. I said all my prayers, went to church regularly, did everything. I was a good person. But this bad thing happened to me or to my loved one. And why would God do this to me? So they blame God for the miseries of this life. They don't blame sin or the sin of Adam and Eve. They blame God. And they're angry with God. They hate God. And when you hate someone, you cannot be with that person that you hate. You don't want to be with that person. And so being in heaven, it's not just a place of blissfulness. It's being with God, entering into this loving relationship with God. And you have to love God in order to enter into this relationship. If you hate God, you simply cannot do it. So the point is that it's not enough for us simply to believe in God. You know, the scripture says even the demons believe and tremble. But we have to have the right attitude towards God. And in order to have the right attitude towards God, we need to have the right understanding of what God is like. And if we think that God sends people to hell, then we might think, oh, well, maybe God is not pleased with me. Maybe God has withdrawn his blessings and his graces from me. Maybe God is going to send me to hell because of my lack of faith or my sinfulness or whatever it may be. This is how we start thinking which is exactly what the devil wants. And if we get into such a state, we end up giving in to despair. We kind of give up on trying. But this is not what God is like. You know, scripture says that God desires the salvation of everyone. And God works at trying to call us back to him at all times. So, uh, you know, uh, scholars point out that God continues to love the souls of the damned. So God loves everyone who's in hell. God doesn't hate anyone. But they don't benefit by his love because they have rejected God. And God did not create hell. The evil spirits created hell. Hell is really a separation from God. They chose to be separated from God. And so anybody who ends up in hell, they're choosing to be separated from God for whatever reason. So yes, even though it's like the most horrible place and it lasts for all eternity, they would rather be in hell than be with the one that they hate. They hate him so much, or they end up hating him so much at the end of their lives. They don't want to be with God. So it's very important that we have the right understanding of God's love for us. God loves each and every one of us. He's already paid the penalty for all of our sins, even our future sins. So in other words, we should never despair. But you see, this is the mistake that the apostles made. So yes, they believed in Jesus, but then when he's arrested, when things got kind of difficult for them, they became afraid. They thought the same thing would happen to them, and they, so they flee. They give up their hope in Jesus. You know, we read when, when the uh, two disciples are on their way, way to Emmaus, oh, we thought he was the one who would come to save us, but 
You know, he was crucified, he's dead, he's gone. It's kind of like they forget what he had said. He had told them in advance that he would have to die, but that he would resurrect. It's kind of like they forgot everything because of their fear. They couldn't think straight. So the whole point is um, that when we experience difficulties in our lives, sometimes we have spiritual dryness. When we pray, we don't feel this connection with God that ideally we should feel. Or something bad happens to us. We might be dying of cancer or who knows what. Maybe we're on our deathbed. Maybe we're all isolated. Or maybe we're all alone. Our family can't be with us. And people think, oh, God has abandoned me. God must not love me. Or people think, oh, I haven't been able to go to confession. God will never forgive me. Well, make a per try to make a perfect act of contrition. Trust in God's love for you. Don't despair. And if you do have that opportunity to go to confession, by all means, go to confession. But never doubt that God loves you and that God is always there for you no matter what situation you find yourself in. Even if you're totally by yourself, God is there. God loves you and he wants to give you his divine assistance. But we must turn to him with faith and trust.